Uh, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for me to be invited to chair this first session today, and I would like to thank Dr. Hani El Saich for this. I'm glad to say that on our panels today, we have some real experts on heritage issues concerning Islam's holy sites in Arabia, and I am, I am not one of them, I hasten to add. I'll have the pleasure in introducing to you our first two speakers, who for most of you will need no introduction. Lord Hankey, Donald Hankey, the eminent architect and conservationist, with whom I've worked together with Dr. El Saich on the Islamic Museum in London, and Dr. Irfan Alawi, Professor of Islamic Thought and Sufism, who has not yet arrived, but we are expecting him to arrive shortly. Just to explain, my area of expertise is somewhat different. Most of my career has been in the diplomatic service, and this started here, in fact, with a year studying Arabic at SOAS, after which I was posted to Baghdad, where I, I stayed for two years before being expelled uh, during the June War of 1967, when we all fled into that oasis of pro-Western influence called Iran. I did not continue as an Arabist in the Foreign Office, but made a career which took me to Latin America, Southeast Asia, the Balkans, and the former Soviet Union. It was in Georgia in particular where I opened our embassy in 1995 and presented credentials to Edward Shevardnadze that questions of architectural heritage first came into my orbit. When I saw in particular how the wonderful heritage of our Nouveau buildings in Tbilisi was under threat. Later on in 2004, I was instrumental in setting up the British Georgian Society here in London, of which we are glad to have Dr. Al Saich as a member. We encouraged the Society to take a serious interest in Tbilisi's architectural heritage and we staged several events at Alan Baxter Associates to highlight these problems. And more recently, we have been dis uh, discussing here in London the setting up of a Tbilisi heritage group to carry forward this work. But all, what, all, all this is far removed from the topic of today, which is, and I quote, um, and Dr. Haniel Saich has asked me to reiterate this title of today's uh, discussion, uh, quotes, awareness of the heritage sites of the Arabian Peninsula, end quotes. Clearly a topic of great importance to Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And a topic, um, I would say, not without its political sensitivities. But I believe we can shed real light on the issues involved without falling foul of polemics. <clears throat> Finally, I should like to pay tribute to Dr. Hani El Saich, the prime mover behind this event, and to thank him for bringing it to fruition despite the personal difficulties which he has been suffering recently. And perhaps we could express our thanks to him now with a, with a round of applause. I would stress we have time constraints. Uh, the first uh, session, uh, it's now 1.20, is due to end at 2.30, uh, when there will be a break for coffee. But before... Uh, the two presentations, uh, or sorry, after the two presentations, we will, of course, have a question and answer session. Um, so, assuming our second speaker arrives, that means we have about half an hour for each presentation. Lord Hankey, uh, a distinguished architect with a, a worldwide reputation as a leading heritage and uh, conservation expert, he's the founder and chairman of the architecture firm Gilmore Hankey Kirk, and he was the founder, uh, founder chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on architecture and planning. He is president of ICOMOS UK, that is the council, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, and uh, a consultant for international agencies for conservation architecture and conservation planning. Uh, so, who better to uh, start on our discussions and our insights into heritage problems uh, as we are to discuss? Thank you very much.
there is such a barrage of implements that there's nowhere to put my paper. I think you'll have to sweep them off. Okay, why don't you put them up there or something? Can we move them back? <clears throat> right. Thank you. Ah. Yep. <clears throat> well, I'm glad for that clarification of the title of our meeting today. I think we have to start from a point of view of cross-cultural respect. Um, and it is very important here to look at the background to the subject of tangible heritage site management with particular reference to nationally important places which are the subject of intense public gathering. It is a big subject, so I must perforce be brief, but it is fundamental to any rational discussion of any heritage. My own background experience is as a conservation architect and planner and founder of a multidisciplinary organization, as you heard, of architects, planners, engineers, economists, and sociologists called GHK Consulting Limited. My work concerns world and national heritage sites and cities and the generation of planning and development policies and associated architectural and planning works. Often, the objective is to achieve conservation of the assets, sustainable reuse, interpretation and presentation so that you can promote participation by the community and a broad understanding of values and significance. And of course, the management is critical for the historic environment and the way it is integrated into planning matters. For today, I might draw on examples from China, uh, India, Pakistan, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia, I was responsible with an international team for working for the Supreme Commission for Tourism to promote the various different required projects for their cultural heritage in 2005. And I've had a long history with Saudi being responsible for uh, designing King Khalid's Memorial Mosque in, on the Al Aruba Road in Riyadh for about 4,500 people. And um, I first started working in Saudi in 1968. So I claim some interest in this subject. Heritage and the best practice and paradigms um, is where I would like to start. Whether it is world heritage or local heritage, the principles for conservation and management are very similar. Because planning for the future and for the future of our past involves social, economic, cultural, commercial, macro and micro political considerations, we all have to look holistically at the development challenges and include all stakeholder interests in our considerations. Much is written about management of a heritage, and there are now some very important documents to be used as reference, such as the Barra Charter of Australia, the China Principles, the Washington Charter, the Historic Urban Landscape Initiative, which was launched in 2005 by including inherited values and cultural significance of their wider context into strategies for conservation and urban development. The objective was, and still is, to cope with the increasing pressures exerted on historic areas. The HUL initiative emerged from the International Conference on World Heritage and Contemporary Architecture, Managing the Historic Urban Landscape, which was held in Vienna in 2005. This resulted in the Vienna Memorandum. And that memorandum rethought the urban conservation principles and paradigms 
which continue to be the subject of international expert meetings organized by UNESCO. The publication recently, in uh, October 2010, of the World Heritage Center's management, uh, it's paper number 27, Managing Historic Cities, by Ron Van Eerts of UNESCO's World Heritage Committee, begins to set out a very trustworthy paradigm for heritage preservation planning, design, and management for the diverse stakeholder interests that are to be found in any historic environment. The point is, there is an increasing body of experience that points to best practice. And that experience is available through ICOMOS, through the World Heritage Committee, and through English Heritage. And I would like to make the point that in this country, English Heritage has a really excellent reputation. And I was delighted in an international conference in Dublin in October to hear that many countries of the world look to English Heritage for the guidance on how they manage conservation issues. There is world heritage. <clears throat> Let me, before I do that, I, I have a slide here of York. The city of York is very important because in 1960s, Lord Isha um, developed the conservation plan for the city. And it was highly methodical. It understood the value and significance of the in, in existing properties. It looked at how you could maximize their use. It regenerated and retained the historic environment around the great monument of the cathedral, which is world heritage. And of course, to the right hand side, you've got the Roman wall, if you don't know York, but it goes down here, all right? That is the Roman wall to the city. And set among the city down here is Jorvik, the Viking center. What I'm saying is that a place carries a long-standing, important cultural message about the identities of the people who live there. It gives a stature and meaning to themselves as Yorkists, or whatever you would call them. I have mentioned World Heritage because it is subject to the strict conservation of its outstanding universal value that is compatible with sustainable use. World Heritage is defined in the UNESCO Convention of 1972 and governed by the operational guidelines which are constantly revised, last time in January 2008. And they're governed um, uh, by those guidelines for its identification, selection, and management of World Heritage sites. There are some 187 countries who have signed the World Heritage Convention of 1972, and there are some 151 states, we call them state parties, who have registered world or tentative list heritage. Such cultural heritage falls under the responsibility of ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, Natural heritage is the concern of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, based in uh, Switzerland. And the, natural uh, and the training and education comes under the International Center for the Conservation in Rome. And they are all international bodies with international membership of countries of the world. So we bring together a very important range of theoretical and practical experience. Um, my next slide is of Paris. You will see the um, Notre Dame there on the island, and you will see how inappropriate Tour Montparnasse is, you see its long shadow, in a city of 
very cohesive building heights and urban grain. Of course, there's the exception here of the Eiffel Tower. And that was built, as you know, at the end of the 19th century and is a great icon for Paris. But it's the exception rather than the rule. So urban planning, the urban grain, the height of buildings is the basis for developing an urban aesthetic which should be set out in a framework by every place, every city. Otherwise, what we have with places like the Shard, not that I would like to criticize the eventual building of the Shard, which is rather fun, but it's a product of lawyers beating the system for the sake of the developer. And the state isn't expert at defending itself. And we are not expert at defining value and significance. We don't actually have a very good language for defining value. There is a, an ethical and political problem. <clears throat> so with change and conservation, uh, it is a fact of history that as the creators of the Industrial Revolution, we in the West should also have become leaders in the preservation of our existing and most valuable environments. The revolution of change is now global and requires us to define practical and ethical rules for our international trade, economies, travel, communications, political relationships, and cultural identities. The questions of what you keep and why become more urgent as the speed of change worldwide increases. In order to plan for people and not just for sectoral interests, it is essential to find an ethical balance between competing interests without damaging the cultural values of an object of a, or of a place. And this touches upon a diverse range of considerations. And I think they're very important. Human rights, the right to express yourself, the right to decide. Because I work in China, this is uppermost in my mind, and even more so because I'm currently working on the two cities of Chufu and Zhaocheng, which is where Confucius and Mencius, two of China's greatest moral philosophers, uh, had their base. So they're very important problem, projects. And I think ethics should enter into our understanding of each other to a much greater degree than it does. So human rights, social and cultural identity and practice is enormously important. The economic, political, scientific, legal and regulatory issues are very important considerations. Appropriate design for scientific construction. Many of the problems in conservation are just that people are too ignorant to know when to use lime water, when not to use cement, how to um, design scientifically so you don't get condensation in the middle of the fabric. So there's a lot of technical improvement at grassroots that should be promoted. And finally, planning and management issues. If you can't manage, you're not going to get the results. And if you don't look holistically at the design and management of these factors, uh, you will fail in giving the expert understanding and skill that it requires. Let me talk about UNESCO. I've lost myself with the slides. Ah, I've got down to UNESCO. UNESCO Convention of 1972 and the operational guidelines, which I've spoken about, and other charters, conventions, and guidelines all define how, why, and what to conserve and to manage. The administrative, legal, regulatory, and good governance experience of many Western countries can now suggest the best methods for integrating management across the many sectors of the political framework. I say suggest because we must not dictate. Everybody has their starting point, whether you like it or not. And if you say they're wrong, you're presuming 
that they have no right to think the way they do. But it is the art of diplomacy of whom an expert exponent sits on this stage that to get consensus among the divisive opinions that can take place when we're too prejudiced. <coughs> Ethics is very important in order to avoid conflict in a world where we must share and manage our resources. There is a need, to be ethically, we, there is a need for us to be ethically correct in the way we respect and accept the starting point of other cultures. There is no point telling the Chinese, where I work, or the countries of the Middle East or Africa, that we do it this way in Europe. Some of our experience, if we listen to our hosts, can be expressed as complementary and generic solutions to our common objectives. And it is best expressed as examples from within the country's own context. When it comes to heritage, there are not many different ways of conserving and managing it. The historic character of places embodies the very essence of our diverse cultural identities. It is that political, social, cultural, geographical, and economic diversity that brings both a strength to the meaning of life on this planet, and yet is so often a threat to our cultural identities. In the case of holy places um, and our shared cultural sites and all listed or registered cultural heritage, we share it through our common values. There is a responsibility to accept these values and that such acceptance and cross-cultural respect is increasingly a component of emerging definitions of human rights. Even if heritage sites are not listed, it would indeed be offensive to minority interests to ride roughshod over them in planning for change. And China has a wonderful problem, a wonderful challenge with its minorities. Respecting minorities, but the Han culture is so dominant they find it difficult to be tolerant. They will still want to control, but they won't devolve identity and expression very easily to rural communities where they, they represent a, a, a cultural minority. And China has some 30, 40 cultural minorities, and these are terrifically important in the country. And the Chinese are just learning how important it is not to quell, not to squash that cultural uh, identity. <laughs> Holy places are perhaps the most universally shared heritage. And it behoves us to take care to respect them, to respect belief systems in the way we plan and manage the conservation of common values. But there is always a challenge to balance contemporary sectoral interests with those of the wider community to both give rights to express different ideas, but also to allow compromise with the interests of the wider community, perhaps upon whom everything depends. If you want to conserve something which you value highly, but there is no money, there is no way of making it pay for itself, you have to compromise somewhere. The wider interest is doing something where other people will come and support you if it's not sustainable as an object to stand alone. The law on all of these matters is rough, but a necessary tool that sets a framework within which we can operate. Science, understanding, dialogue, and reason are essential tools in all these matters. So there is a real challenge to find ethically correct ways to balance differential interests. Like all popular heritage, holy places suffer the same range of pressures from development. And I'm showing you here the slide of the Le Shan Grand Buddha, which was started construction in 714 and um, 
was completed about 810 and is the biggest carved Buddha in the world next to the Ming and the Dadu River. No, it's the Ming and the Dadu River. And um, sits in a very important heritage site containing numerous libraries, historic buildings, and a wonderful environment. But it has been necessary to expand the site much larger. This is the city of Lushan. Here is the Buddha. And uh, the Chinese are very capable of not understanding how to manage. And there were many problems, which there isn't time to go into here. And I was involved in this site for about uh, six years. And it is an extraordinary object uh, with great majesty looking out over the river. The high tide, the high flood level, comes just up to the level of the platform at the Buddha's feet. But the only access for the public is down that cliff face. And with 30,000 people on maximum uh, visits, uh, there is one hell of a pressure for people to try and enjoy this monument. So the Chinese have found it very difficult to accept that the only way is constructing a platform above high water level along the cliff face. Um, and there are various possibilities of designing lifts through the rock and all the rest of it. Uh, the exit is round this side and goes along the cliff in a sort of suspended walkway, as I suggest along here. However, that is for the Chinese to sort out over time. Uh, it is a place of worship. It's a place that requires intense management, intense interpretation, and needs to serve a very diverse range of experiences that come to visit it. So it's a question of communication, of organization, of conservation, of tourism management, tourism planning, of uh, they've now constructed another museum some way down, um, and that uh, the museum's up here, and the public go from the car park and walk all the way down to the Buddha and around this site. It's a wonderful place with many spiritual messages to it. Like all popular heritage, holy places suffer the same range of pressures from development. There are unprecedented economic growth, expanding urban population, modernization, market pressures that raise land values, and rampant growth of roads and supporting infrastructure that have put many cultural assets at serious risk. And I will show you a slide of Mecca and perhaps illustrate that point later. Overcrowding in historic areas results in rapid deterioration, both of social relationships and the fabric of the buildings. Unclear ownership rights or uncaring subletting leads to deferred maintenance and decay of both modern and old buildings. Um, let me digress just for a moment. This is the city of Chufu. Uh, Confucius died in 479 BC. And this cemetery has been used for two and a half thousand years by the family of Confucius. The family of Confucius lived in the mansion, 450 rooms, and the temple is here. And that zone inside the walls <coughs> is the buffer zone. So there is a great challenge for the Chinese to design in context. And when you look at Mecca, you will want to think about what design in context means. And it is an extremely uh, fascinating place, which I'd talk for two hours on, but not now. Um, this is the Confucius ceremony that took place in September this year, which I had the privilege of attending. And um, <coughs> there's lots of ceremony, and um, it's very well organized and very well 
filmed, unfortunately, which rather destroys the um, dignity of this spiritual occasion. I'm going to take you, when it comes to my point about maintenance, to the city of Shiban, which I was able to photograph from the aircraft window. As uh, I asked the pilot, please go right and dip your wing. And I was able to photograph Shiban from the air. And here you've got the Wadi. Here you've got this World Heritage Site historic city constructed of mud where the mud is eight stories high. But I made the point about lack of maintenance. And perhaps this is the ultimate result of a lack of maintenance. Because there is a mud building that wasn't maintained. And looking after the material is very important and you have to do it correctly. All right, well, we'll go to Mecca in due course. Uh, a narrow definition of cultural heritage can emphasize high-profile buildings and monuments rather than the value of living culture and urban landscapes. Municipal governments and private developers often have a shared goal to profit from large redevelopment projects to the detriment of the historic environment. The adjacent historic context, which I was talking about at Chufu, is often inadequately respected. There's the, the great mosque in Mecca. But it may also express the deep historic roots of the community, that area around. Its response to external influences and provide evidence for its development over the centuries. The context may form an important relationship to the heritage site with its urban character and scale and with its historic, economic, scientific, and social values, which, if not retained, may devalue the meaning of the heritage. The 140 countries of ICOMOS agree that the spirit of place is a significant factor that should be respected. Defense against uh, development pressures is made harder if the values of the heritage and its context are not defined. The world is not yet well practiced at such definitions, but excellent work has been done by the World Heritage Committee in setting the methodology for de de determining OUV. This has yet to be copied by lesser heritage. And where the formal legal and regulatory structure has not been developed, complex planning decisions are so often left to the political whims of local leaders. And this is where being able to conserve the existing environment is a deep reflection of the, of the quality of our political relationships and the leadership, and whether the leadership is capable of devolving authority to lesser levels in the country. We suffer from that in this country, so let's not be too proud. Maybe we went to war incorrectly because of some dominant fee, uh, figure at the top. We cannot afford to think that we always do it right. We have lessons to learn. We have many problems of this sort in many countries of the world. And one of the lessons I said to the minister in both Yemen, Minister of Culture in Yemen, and the Minister of Tourism and Antiquities in Jordan, is that if you take all the decisions, who is there to arbitrate when something goes wrong? Taking a decision yourself as minister may also mean other things that benefit you. And that is a bit of a worry, because that integrity has to run through a system if people are going to speak freely and act freely and have a place. The paradox of leadership is that power has to be devolved. Otherwise, as leader, you're responsible for everything that goes wrong. So what is to be done? The world is learning how to use cultural heritage to expand economic opportunities and revenues, to enhance the quality of life, and to generate positive identity and energy for development at the local level. 
In all of this, there is room for the contextual modern environment, but not for the ego trip of the architects. And I don't know if this is an ego trip of Foster or if it is a decree by the royal family of Saudi Arabia. Heritage can strengthen cities by preserving a sense of place and by expressing historical values and the distinctive material, intellectual, spiritual, and emotional features that characterize a society or social group. Skills in environmental management and conservation should follow established best practice. But many countries do not participate in the development of best practice, and Saudi Arabia doesn't. It's, not, it's got lots of members of ICOMOS, but it doesn't have any members attending any international meetings. So there's no feedback. And it's not the only country that is weak in that respect. Uh, many countries do not participate in the development of best practice or apply established principles which are now increasingly available on the web. The professions and the governing administrations have to Strengthen urban planning and administrative teamwork. Are we all right on time? N we should be We're way over it. Right. passing on to the next speaker right. soon, who is right. Dr. James Dickey. All right. Yes. And, Would you like to come and join us up here? And uh, skills to incorporate all stakeholder interests and professional skills by engineers, planners, environmentalists, etc. They all have to be strengthened. We have to strengthen development control mechanisms and support by administrative, legal, and regulatory systems. If you don't set a framework within which people can legally, contractually, relate to each other, well, devil take the hindmost. You haven't got a system. So the structure of the law is fundamental, not just to me, but to the Chinese, not just here in the UK, but to the whole of Europe, to the whole of the Middle East, Everywhere in the world, if you don't set frameworks, you have no structure within which the private sector or private initiative can take place. We have to ensure that laws and regulations are the foundation for social, political and economic relationships. We have to support public awareness and understanding and through agreed policies develop manuals covering planning, design and management principles, guidelines and practical advice for conserving and managing historic cities and sites. We have to require business and management plans for all proposals for development activities, whether by city agencies or private developers, and submit cultural heritage impact assessments and justification of sustainability through giving appropriate approvals. We have to enhance the capacity of institutions and professionals at the local level. There's a shortage of skills. We have to use participatory planning for cultural heritage conservation. Participatory. That means the community has to be involved. This can be helpful also in raising awareness and generating community support. And finally, cultural tourism planning through support for data collection, market research, strategy development, and training for tourism bureau officials, site managers, and local communities, and preventing excessive use and damage to the fabric is very important if we're going to conserve and respect the story of our historic environment. And finally, this is Mecca and the mosque. And there is the Kaaba in the middle. Dr. Ali Al-Haban, uh, the uh, leader of the Supreme Commission for Tourism in Saudi Arabia, who is a good friend, um, reminds me that the works in Mecca are by royal decree. Well, that is perhaps a problem. Because what does the royal decree actually know does anybody say to your royal leader, you're wrong? I think something else. I had to say to Prince Charles with the gates at Constitution Hill, 
excuse me, sir, but the technical committee doesn't actually agree with the solution that you think might be nice uh, for these reasons. And I think ideas, and I say this to the Chinese, have to flow up as well as down. Does that happen in Saudi? I don't think it does. It's very nice for the leaders to decide, but sometimes they can be wrong. But look, politics is the art of correcting mistakes. And here you have a very big building. Um, and I, have I got another slide? Yes. This is uh, the mosque in full flight, as it were. Fantastic experience. It's a fantastic experience, that place. But there, the historic environment to the north of the mosque is not intrusive. But if you go now to the south and southeast, you have a big Ben, which this picture doesn't show, but it's at the top here. And you have a vast construction overlooking the spiritual identity of this place. The, the decision may be wrong. The building of tall buildings around the mosque, which you will see on this slide, may be the intention. Here's one construction. Here is open site. These are the old roads, but they've disappeared. Here are the old roads of historic Mecca that have disappeared. And this awaits future construction. There is a hole as foundation for new construction. This is a picture of 2010 in February. Google is a wonderful instrument. It helped me enormously. But it does, it does tell us something about what might be going to happen and we have to ask whether in the context of such a wonderful holy place, the intrusion of people in their nightshirts from their windows up in the sky, looking down, is the right relationship. Um, but we have to remember that Mecca is not a World Heritage Site. So reviewing its urban area around the mosque and defining the context for this mosque and preserving it, which is what the World Heritage Committee would ask for, is not possible if they're going to build that sort of thing. Sorry, I missed it. Here we are. And um, it, it poses a problem. And I will leave it there. But that, I hope, is the background which we need to respect in discussing any matter about vandalism to the historic sites of Mecca and Medina. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Hani, audience, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps in my poem, I may not be as diplomatic as Dr. Hankey, or uh, Lord Hankey was, uh, so perhaps uh, I'll, I'll sort of uh, immediately go into it uh, with your permission. Saudi, the letters S-A-U-D-I, I have given it a new acronym, which stands for Soulless Arabs Under Delusionary Infidels. Shall I repeat it again? Soulless Arabs under delusionary infidels. They call themselves the custodians, Sharif al Haramain. The entitlement of such an honor, I ask whence it comes, is nothing but to mock the Muslims. Unsophisticated Ummah is a sucker to a swindle. Unsophisticated Ummah is a sucker to a swindle. These custodians are lacking in piety. You saw the building construction where someone in the pajamas uh, could be having a view of the holy shrines. These custodians are lacking in piety. Age of ignorance did not perish. 
pride of all the prophets gave Islam, but, but Wahhabi creed celebrates ignorance. But Wahhabi creed celebrates ignorance. Destruction of the holy sites, abode of the Allah's Habib is eliminated. All places of reverence are reduced to rubble. Deafening silence of the world, no muted challenge here. For the rulers of the desert kingdom frequently use the petrodollars to muzzle any voice of rebuke. Usurpers of Hejaz are extreme vandals. Usurpers of the Hejaz are extreme vandals. Plunder and pillage is their trademark. For Wahhabis and Salafis, celebration of the heritage is heretic. Celebration of the heritage is heretic. But to terrorize humanity is heroic. In the midst of time, the Uba Ummah will know the oaths. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. If we're going to stick to our schedule, I think we better move on now to question and answer. And if Dr. El Madawi would like to make an intervention, I, I, I suggest she does it in the second half. Yes, yes. So question and answers. We've got about 10 minutes, uh, and then we break for coffee. Well, I have one question uh, just quickly to, um, to Dr. El Sai. He mentioned the... Islamic Museum in London project. I'd just like to ask him to tell <coughs> us where the project is now. Well, although the, uh, the seminar has nothing to do with the museum project, but I'm glad uh, you asked this to allow the cameras to take this message uh, uh, to the Arab uh, uh, countries. Uh, the, the project is still on paper. And uh, we, were, uh, we were encouraged by Clarence House to, uh, to go and meet um, Qatar leaders, which is, I think, um, the only leaders is the, the emir himself or his good wife, uh, Sheikh Moza. And luckily, I know both of them when they were young, when they were in London. And also, uh, uh, good luck that I know the ambassador himself since he was very young and he's a he's a nice guy uh, he's uh, he's not claiming uh, more than being an ambassador for the emir and i'm trying to um, to meet with 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 them next week uh, and i said to him i uh, i dream that i'm not dead when the museum is open now there's two sites we uh, we like uh, to obtain one of them, and both belongs to the Amir, one in Chelsea uh, and one in uh, High Street Kensington, in, Olymp uh, in, in Kensington Gore. Just uh, wish, uh, pray for me and wish me uh, all the luck that I can actually walk to, the, uh, to Qatar <laughs> while I fly uh, and, and uh, talk to them. I only need your support. Thank you, honey. Um, there was a question there, and then um, yeah, yeah. up the back there. I wanted to ask you if you had any rough estimates of the number of religious um, sites or sites of religious heritage or importance that you think have been destroyed. How many and where? In, in Mecca. Well, uh, may I uh, elaborate even more? Uh, they actually paid, I just go back uh, to there because I'm an artist. I always think to start from the clay. Uh, they asked the Syrian government 10 years ago to sell one whole street, which is this street, uh, it's Byzantine street, uh, was probably Roman street before Byzantine. Uh, and now uh, you may call it Syrian because the Christian and Muslim live together there. 
and the Byzantinian were, were Christian, as you know. They wanted to buy this street to redevelop the street all for the Syrian. You know, they give them money, say, we develop it for you. And luckily, one man uh, there, he was nearer to the uh, high Iraqi uh, people there, and he spoke to the president, and he said, look, they're talking about destroying our heritage. And uh, last year, in a, in a meeting at uh, Chatham House, and, uh, yeah, in Chatham House, uh, I had discussion with the Syrian ambassador, and he said, no, the, uh, the government, uh, two years ago, the government uh, refused, and we returned the money back. And this is uh, one of the th uh, good things. Now, we come to Mecca and Medina. I went to Mecca during the 70s, and uh, I saw the destruction there. Now, what I saw, I saw places... I couldn't see them if Meccan people did not tell me that. I saw places where our prophet was, uh, was born, um, uh, his, uh, his mother was born, uh, his mother place, and, and many, many doors and many, many houses belongs to our khulafa. All were destroyed. And, and also, they couldn't tell me, actually, this and that. They take me nearly three miles away from Mecca, and they run away from their car. We walk to, towards the desert, and then they check on. They check me whether I'm carrying. Uh, we didn't have mobiles then, but whether I have a, a recorder or something. And they tell me, "Honey, please go to London and tell people we're losing our sight." I estimate that uh, probably 99 places out of 100 were destroyed, but these 99, uh, my younger brother, are all the main heritage of us, like the birth of our prophet, the birth of Fatima al-Zahra, his daughter, the, uh, I mean, I, I, I cannot name it with this horrible disease I am, I'm carrying, ca cancer, uh, but uh, you, will, you will hear it from the uh, second speech, uh, speakers, uh, Dr. James Dickey as well as Orfan. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hani. If, uh, I, if, I, if I could add to what Hani has just said, um, my experience with the Supreme Commission for Tourism is that national policy is not to encourage sites that are secondary to those of the prophet himself. They don't want um, adulation, adoration of secondary characters in Islam. They don't like saints. And while it is unfortunate for the other, as other followers of Islam, it does present a prejudicial policy towards the history of Islam. We would not damage the sites of secondary personages because they give color and perspective to the whole story. Um, but there you have a philosophy in Saudi that is run by the royal family and does limit the way they conserve and respect sites of secondary heritage importance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Mondawi. In a country like Saudi Arabia, it is extremely difficult to imagine that a pressure group can actually succeed. This doesn't uh, mean that uh, these initiatives don't exist. I don't, I'm sure you're aware of the work of Sami Angawi, who has worked very hard in order to preserve some aspects of, of that city that is actually the heritage of all Muslims and mm. not the Saudis. But what I wanted to ask you is, how could the international community uh, remain so silent while um, this destruction of Mecca takes place and continues to take place? When power is mixed with economic fortune, this is what we're going to get in a place like Mecca. And it is extremely difficult for all Muslims, actually, to come together for one simple reason. Not because they're cowards or they can be bribed by money, but because Mecca involves one of the, most, one of the important uh, 
pillars of Islam, and it is related to Hajj. Probably today, there are hundreds of Muslims who would like to have attended this conference or this workshop, if you want, but they are intimidated because if they are seen on these cameras, they may not actually get a Hajj visa next time. And I can guarantee in, uh, there are so many people in this room, including myself, who cannot go and perform the Hajj because of our political ideas or because of what we do in London. And not many people would like to be seen here. And this is possibly why the room is empty. So this is an important factor to be taken into account. If you oppose uh, what the Saudis are doing in Mecca, you may not be able to complete your Islam. So that, that's just one thing to take uh, into consideration. It's not like preserving Notre Dame in Paris or the Buddhist uh, statues in China. It is actually an ongoing problem that cannot be solved uh, for many Muslims. Now, uh, Dr. Hani, I really don't know what to say. You refer to the Al Saud as a tribal Bedouin society, and this is one of the myths that are perpetuated, and I don't blame you for making that mistake. Uh, the Saudis, and I would say the ruling family, is not tribal, and it is not Bedouin. They are basically autocrats that behave like any other autocrat. Mm -hmm. If they were tribal and Bedouin, they wouldn't have behaved in the same way as you have sketched in your presentation. And the Saudis uh, are unfortunate in the sense that they have the combination of this ruling family that has incredible resources. And this has actually contributed to perpetuating the, the situation. But we are not ignorant and we're not nomadic. And even if we, our ancestors were, we are extremely proud of them. Can I say, I think you touch on a very fundamental issue about freedom, human rights, about expression, about democracy, about participation, about building consensus, about the whole process of good governance. And I work for the World Bank in many different countries. And that is where the challenge lies. You see the results, but it won't get right until we start looking at the ethics of our relationships. Mm. Another question there, yes, thank you. Uh, given, the, uh, given some of the points made, especially by the, by, by the previous speaker, would the panel accept that there is, an, uh, given the, the problems that people in Saudi have, the problems that Muslims in the rest of the world have, if they, in, in fearing to speak, in, in, in being unable to exert any influence in these matters, would the panel accept that there is a very specific British responsibility in these matters? We've heard about uh, Prince Charles's role on, in architectural matters many times. And would, would, the, would the panel accept that uh, Prince Charles and others in Britain have a particular responsibility in Saudi Arabia because, after all, we speak about the Wahhabis, we speak about the Al-Saud, but who put them there? How did they get there? They didn't just uh, grow, 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 grow out of the desert spontaneously. So, uh, <laughs> but can, can, we, can we please have some word from, from ruling circles in, in Britain to take action on these matters before it's too late. Uh, as... On a personal note, my father was a diplomat in Tehran and was responsible for getting cash to uh, King Abdulaziz during the war in order for him to survive. So maybe I have some genetic relationship there. But... Yeah, I, I, it's, the point you make is very important, but actually it's not just Prince Charles, it's everybody. And if I would congratulate Prince Charles, it is that he doesn't think about the benefits of development, he thinks about the impact on people. And everything we do is for people. And Prince Charles thinks about people and the quality of their lives. And he does strike a cross-cultural note anywhere he made that wonderful uh, definition of how we should treat things cross-culturally with King Abdul, Abdullah II of Jordan in 2005 in Cairo, where he said, it's not understanding, it's not tolerating, it's actually accepting the way other people think. And once you can accept it, 
you have a base of working together. But if you poo-poo, tolerate, it doesn't work. It's about the way people relate. And Prince Charles is a great advocate for people's relationships. Whatever he says about architecture, which you can disagree with, it doesn't matter, but the quality of what he thinks is often very good. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa sayyidina wa habibana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My respected uh, guests, Lord Hanky, and uh, honorable speakers, um, we have been uh, uh, looking forward to this conference. And I'm just going to give you my very brief details. Um, I'm a historian on, the, on Mecca and Medina. I've been working on this historical sites for a number of years, perhaps 20 plus. Uh, and the person who I'd been working with was the late Dr. Muhammad Abdul Yamani, rahimullah. Um, and many other scholars within the kingdom. Uh, Foremost, the late Sheikh Bab al Haram Sayyid Muhammad bin Alwi al Maliki. Um, and uh, basically, uh, I'm a lecturer at university as well, teaching law, um, as well as concentrating on the destruction of the holy sites within particular Al Hijaz. I hate calling it Saudi Arabia, so I rather call it Jazirat al Arab or Al Hijaz. Um, I think. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a bid'ah in itself, uh, so this, the name says. Um, <clears throat> I've been given some uh, ample time, I think, and I think it's important that we, we realize it's not a picture show, and it's not here to sort of uh, just look at the pictures and think, oh, wow, you know, uh, it's immaculate uh, images and um, uh, the Kaaba and so forth. It's important to realize, um, before I start, uh, on the heritage topic, on the subject, that, um, if I can get this right, we having, uh, before I move on, we having the website, uh, it's Islamic Heritage uh, hyphen or dash, so it's Islamic-Heritage.org. The website will be launched very shortly. It will have images, articles on um, the heritage which we have lost and the forthcoming plans uh, by the Bin Laden uh, group. What I would like to mention is that we're currently suffering, the world is suffering through uh, terrible turmoil. We had um, you know, we have only recently we had an earthquake up north of England. Those who perhaps might remember just, I think, I believe last week. And then we had some floods in Australia. Uh, and quite recently in Pakistan, we've had several earthquakes. Why is it that we are having, the world is suffering these earthquakes? Of course, the hadith is narrated by the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that near the end of time, uh, that, we will su that we will suffer from many turbulations, which is so. But I want to concentrate what is the reason? <coughs> One of the reasons is because, uh, I, I hate walking around, I mean, um, one of the reasons that we, we are saving that is because, uh, you'll understand this better, is that the, the Kaaba itself is the center of the universe. It's the Kalb, the heart of the universe. Now, if I was to turn around and take anyone's heart and start messing around with it and I'm not qualified then of course uh, you will collapse or something seriously will happen to you. Now you can imagine what is happening to the Mizan. Uh, the Mizan meaning the balance of the universe and uh, it's important that we realize that because it will give you an indication where we are heading. This is important also for the Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, Surah Al-Naba, Alam naj'al al-arda mihada 
wal jibala aw tada i will translate that allah says in the quran have we not made the earth a resting place for you and the mountains as pegs now clearly if you look at and you will see those images as we go along why we have this turbulence and why the the balance of the world has been disrupted and it's not on the mizan scale as it should be originally uh, because jabal al kaaba uh, jabal abu qubais and many of the mountains which were pegs as mentioned in the quran uh, there were stakes which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, put on to this uh, uh, this uh, earth to stabilize it and create a mizan to balance the world but that's of course has various other factors and i don't have the time to talk on that i wish i did but that's a different uh, topic altogether but i want to elaborate on that not only are we losing the heritage in mecca and medina but we are facing disasters and they are going to get much worse believe me when you are drilling 7 6 8 miles deep into the earth's crust and if i start getting uh, if i if i'm not a surgeon and i start drilling and doing something to your heart obviously it will affect your body that's what's happening to uh, to makkah and that's why it's disturbed now of course right on top of the the, the baitullah here in makkah we have on the 7th heaven the baitul mamur now <clears throat> what we have to realize if they are drilling uh, to make foundations for these skyscrapers uh they are also uh, uh at one stage they were not able to take down or demolish these mountains like abul qubais and uh, jabal qaba jabal khindima jabal hindi and and so forth so what they did in actual fact they started dynamiting them and uh, there is a famous incident <coughs> excuse me which ha- which took place not not very uh, so long ago in in 2 years ago i believe um with jabal umar they will come in the morning uh start digging with the caterpillars and and all the machinery um and then uh, load them with trucks and eventually go and get rid of them then when they come back the next day the whole of the rubble will be back there again which is a, which was a miracle itself so uh and then the mountain became rock hard it became really hard so that uh, it was very difficult for them to continue working with the machinery so what did they start doing they started bringing uh, dynamites and started d- using dynamites now clearly when they started using dynamites it started d- damaging the infrastructure and when they started uh, uh, affecting the infrastructure um we started having uh, of course since over the past i think 10 years ever since this uh, project of uh, the abraj took place we started having turbulences what i would like to also mention here is mecca is a, a is a it's not a, a, an ordinary city it's an holy sanctuary and we should not be treated as an ordinary city uh because as mentioned in the quran it's a, it's a holy sanctuary now of course the borders go far and beyond where uh, the uh, where the pilgrims set foot i mean ac- according to the tradition and the the historians the hudud al haram goes all the way far as uh, as as the hijaz border it's not necessary that it begins from the time of uh, from the border of masjid al miqat or masjid al aisha as we know it as today if you fly over by air space or by land having said that um as time has moved on they have started going toward uh, towards advancement and the advancement is uh, they're looking for more accommodation and of course eventually to um raise the pilgrimage from 3 million to 10 million in the next 6 years. I really don't know how they're going to operate on that because there's no health and safety regulations in the kingdom, especially for the pilgrims. I really feel feel sorry for them. 3 years ago, uh, the Abraj, the tower or um, uh one of the towers next to the the seven towers which are standing overlooking the Kaaba, on the 17th floor it caught fire. and they didn't have any fire uh fighters to come and extinguish this fire and you know what they had to get fire fighters from taif to come and put the fire out uh the fire station for the masjid al haram it's 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 terrible they've only got about three three uh, uh fire engines there and uh, how the fire started it was obviously some welding and some maintenance work was being uh, delivered on the building uh therefore there was no um 
a residence. But I dread to think that if anyone was living at the time uh, in those towers and had they had been completed, uh, it would be a total disaster because there's no way they would be able to come down on, on the lifts from the 20th floor or 17th floor rather uh, and make their way out because it's, it's, it's environmentally it's uh, impossible and at the same time you've got another tower standing next to it so it can cause a lot of damage around the tower and then eventually uh, things can collapse onto the pilgrims or Masjid al-Haram itself. That's how dangerous it is. If we move on to, this is the very first mountain, uh, Jabal uh, Abu Qubais, and of course uh, Masjid al Bilal or uh, Masjid Abu Qubais as he stands there, that's where Bilal al Habshi, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the Prophet Abraham called on to the people, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. And of course, traditionally, it's a very uh, important mountain, and of course, it was, it was removed in the early 1980s to make way for King Fahad's palace as he stands there. Um, you have all these old monument, uh, historical buildings, although they might seem just like normal houses, most of these buildings are actually um, houses uh, which belong to the prophetic, uh, prophet uh, companions or his family. And then you have the, some madrasas, which are the schools next to the Grand Mosque. At, not, at any given time, you wouldn't have any of these buildings uh, higher than the minarets of Masjid al-Haram. Uh, because that was the adab or the etiquette's uh, respect for the shown towards the house of God. Never mind higher than the Baytullah itself, but never higher than the minarets itself. And then you have uh, the musallas or the f uh, four uh, musallas around on different uh, areas of uh, Masjid al-Haram. The Shafi, the Maliki, Hanbali and Hanafi. And they had uh, pluralism and diversity at that time which we have lost uh, 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 over, the, over the centuries. And so you have the, the, the orthodox schools of thought still practicing their, uh, their, um, their way of uh, Islamic Sharia and Fiqh. And of course, that changed. And this is a much far uh, clearer picture. Uh, you, have, you can see them here. Uh, the four schools, orthodox imams would stand and lead the prayers. Uh, here is the Zamzam. Uh, and people could go down and actually consume Zamzam from the source. And of course, it was taken, it was taken away. <clears throat> the sad news is that in 1996, we lost the Kaaba. The Kaaba was rebuilt, and uh, when the people were actually circumambulating during the dwarf of the Kaaba, uh, they didn't know, of course, that what was happening with these whiteboards, as you've seen in the previous image, and they were working in the construction. The argument, of course, by the Saudis was that the, the istawana, or the pillars inside, were deteriorating, and the cockroaches had come and started eating onto the wooden uh, pillars. Um, we could take that with a pinch of salt, but then having said that, there was a danger, because if you were to dig anywhere between the, uh, three to five meters from the Grand Mosque itself towards the Hilton, or Dar al-Dakhid, Fandak, Darutohi, those who have been there, if you were to dig anywhere from the Kaaba and the outer radius of Masjid al-Haram, between three to five meters, you would find sewage. Literally, it's seeping with sewage because there is no uh, accommodation for the sewage system. Those who visit the, 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 for Mecca for Umrah or uh, Hajj, they will realize that most of the hotels which are there from two star to four or five star, uh, they don't have fresh water supplies. And so they have to bring tankers to give these water supplies. Now, what happens with the sewage is the sewage is being pumped back into the ground. And of course, when in the winter season, like we have in Jeddah uh, or, or in Mecca at this time of the year, they have heavy rains. And they had, uh, they had really heavy rains last year. Uh, and that brings, because Mecca is a valley uh, and there is no infrastructure. The petrodollars is there, but they have not used those petrodollars or utilized them for the public safety. And as a matter of fact, the Red Sea is polluted with 70% of raw sewage, as we speak. You can imagine the Islam is based on pillars and tahara or purification, wudu, uh, evolution is part of the faith of Islam. But if you don't have that in the Baytullah, and if the sewage is sipping up when it eventually rains, and you will see the pictures, how can you purify yourselves and visit the house of God when you have this filth? 
Okay, then you have the Kaaba, which is being dismantled. Uh, the Hijr Ismail has been dismantled and then taken down into the big image. Welcome to New York, or Manhattan rather. I've been doing this, you know, for the past 15 years. I've been showing this image for the past 12 years. And I used to say to them that this is to come. And no one literally took my word for it. They said, well, this is an artist artistry impression. It's never going to happen in Mecca, not a chance. But guess what? It's already happened, and it's already too late. Um, this is the, uh, the Hajra Tower, which caught fire on the 17th floor here. You have the tents there on the top. These are sort of uh, uh, beachside uh, 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 relaxing resort, I think, if you can call it. They have uh, trees planted there. And you've got a sip of coffee, you recline back on the bed and have your uh, sip of coffee. And then, of course, somewhere on the floors here, they have women's aerobic, aerobics gymnasium. And then, of course, tin pin bowling, which is to open. The question is that it doesn't remain a, uh, a respectable place for, for the worshipper or the devotees of the Almighty God. I would like to ask this question to the people who are non-Muslims, this would never happen anywhere within the radius of the Vatican. It would never happen anywhere near the White House, and it would never happen anywhere near the Big Ben, or uh, our right honorable Queen Elizabeth's palace, Buckingham Palace. Or St. Paul's. Paul's, thank you. Why is it that we are allowing it to happen by the House of Saud? Uh, the Kaaba or Masjid Nabwi does not belong to the House of Saud, it belongs to every single Muslim in the world. It is an amana. I can stand on the Day of Judgment and I can say to my Lord, well, I did my piece as a one-man team to deliver the message, but it was not my duty to go and do everything. It was a duty for all the Muslim Ummah, as the Prophet said, we are one body. But Muslim Ummah Taban, they've gone to sleep. We become very emotional when they start disturbing Al-Aqsa or the foundation of Al-Aqsa. Well, let me tell you, I've visited Al-Aqsa many times and Al-Aqsa is still under the uh, Awqaf. Um, although I, uh, I, real, I, I realize what's happening under the Zionist rule there and I totally agree and I sympathize with the Muslims and the Palestinians, but let me tell you something very simple and clear. The Qubba of Masjid al-Aqsa, it is in a very poor state. It can collapse at any time. Why would the Saudis not fund it? Because it contains the rock where the Prophet went to the Isra al-Mahraj. To, to the Saudis, it does not matter because this is bid'ah. It is shirk. So it should collapse. That's why the Saudis will not fund it. Why should the Muslims worry about the third holiest site mentioned in the Quran when Mecca and Medina do not remain? Why should the Muslims worry about Al-Aqsa when the Zionists are in control there, but the so-called Muslims are in control in Mecca and Medina? You know, it does not make sense to me. We become emotional as soon as something happens to Al-Aqsa. A holy cemetery is bulldozed in, uh, in, uh, in Palestine or Israel, and we become emotional. The tabloids are full. But when something happens in Baqi, or al Mu'alla or Shabaika, or any of the cemeteries, or any of the companions resting there, say the Amina in Abwa, when they bulldozed and put kerosene over a grave, what do the Muslims do? Nothing. But if something happens to Al-Aqsa, oh, you know, Yahud, they are our enemies. They are this, they are Fulan. I'm sorry. But I disagree with there, because you cannot even protect your own holy city. How are you going to go out and protect somewhere, a small piece of land which belongs to uh, the Muslims, but taking control of the Zionists. Here's the reality. In 2006, this is 2006, okay? Whilst I'm on this image, I'm going to show you something important so you have to realize. This, this is the Osmani part, built by the Ottomans. It's under threat now. It will be demolished any time as we speak because they've already started building two minarets, two minaras near... Uh, uh, Bab al-Umrah or Shamiya side for the expansion of Masjid al-Haram. Okay? So, here it is now, as it was uh, last year. 
Um, if I can get the, uh, the correct, because they keep on increasing the height of this ugly, uh, I call it the Karun uh, Shaitan, the two horns of the devil, uh, because it really does look like the two horns of the devil if you're coming towards Mecca. It is increased in its height to uh, 605 meters. And the danger is, now this is a fact which I think will probably shake all of you, the Abraj, as it's known as, this com the complete section is known as Wakhaf King Abdul Aziz Endowments Project. <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, the Abraj is uh, the size of a whole of this complex, right? A whole of this complex. The size is 271 American football fields. And the clock tower is five times larger than Big Ben, which is going to be standing here, which is built. I'll show you in the next image. But... It will house, these, these towers will house 65,000 people. If something happens here, how on earth are you going to save those 65,000 people? They are going to build mosques inside so we keep you away from the house of God. You open your apartment from there, from your, from your gurfa, open your car and you say, Allahu Akbar. And you do your salah from there because the lifts, the lobby, everything, your rooms are fitted with the microphone system. Now, if you would stand on a clear day, right at the top, you should be able to see Jeddah. That's how tall it is. Um, okay, there you are. What a picture. <laughs> that's how it is today. This is a real image, and that's the construction, and that's why I'm saying that when you go back here, the Osmani part is going to be demolished for the expansion of to join with here. Now, well, they have not won the bid. Alhamdulillah, he's lost the bid. But there are some other shaitans who have won the bid. Um, so now, the thing is that if we don't act now, even we lose the Ottoman part. Now, when I mean Ottoman part, is the house of Umm Hani, the, the aunt of the Prophet, where he went from Isra al-Mahraj, is in the, exactly in that area where they're going to do the opening. And I know where it exactly is, uh, because it's been there as marked by the Ottomans that this was the house where the Prophet was taken to his heavenly journey. If it's not protected now, we'll lose it forever. ...from Sharkia, uh, living in Washington, published a pamphlet about the two pillars that you saw there in Dr. Irfan Alalavi's uh, 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 slide. Uh, these two pillars, one of them contains... Uh, uh, an inscription dating from the time of Ma'amun, the Caliph Ma'amun, son of Harun al-Rashid, of whom everybody here has held Muslim and non-Muslim. And, and non, non they, they date therefore from the 9th century. They mark the point at which the Prophet entered Mecca on, on, on his fat and his vic victory. They, they were incorporated by Sinan, the greatest architect in the history of Islam, who was not born a Muslim but was a convert to Islam, in his rewaks there, the Saudis had planned to demolish them again on the grounds that they were, they were, uh, uh, that they were uh, 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 bidder, in, innovation, uh, 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 a focus of, of, idol, uh, of idolatry. But when this pamphlet was published, they had to desist. They, of course, they are now in danger, uh, in danger again, which means these people operate in the, in the dark, in the, in the shadows. What we must do, I mean, 20 years ago, more than that, Kaleem Siddiqui held a conference precisely on this subject, at which a paper was circulated, by the way, listing all the demolished sites up to that time, say about 25 years ago, uh, in a, a West End hotel. One month later, the Saudi embassy organized a counter-conference in the same hotel, in the same room, at which a resolution was passed at the end saying the sole val valid custodian of the holy, pla the holy places is His Majesty King, uh, uh, king Fahad Ibn <coughs> Abdul Aziz, the drunkard king. They, <coughs> this, of course, was done with Saudi, uh, 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 with, uh, with Saudi money. Now, that has had no resonance, otherwise somebody would have mentioned it here today. But if we have an ongoing campaign, and I have approached the Iranians about, uh, uh, about this, uh, that uh, we organize documentary films, 
publications, holding international seminars, not just in London, but in various, various ve ven venues, although, of course, many Muslim capitals will not allow us to speak against the, uh, the, Sau the Saudis because there was an attempt to silence me in Lahore a few, year, a few, uh, uh, a few years ago. If we can pu uh, 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 publish uh, an album showing left-hand side what the site was before and the right-hand side how it is, how it is not now, publish it in all the mu Muslim la languages, They're, the secret of their success in demolishing Islam is they work from the shadows, like that hijab that they placed around the Kaaba whilst they were demol demol uh, demolishing it. There's a whole hijab around Saudi Arabia. The idea of the pilgrimage now is completely different from what the pilgrimage was in history. In history, the pilgrimage was a gathering of scholars. Uh, a, a, a scholar, for instance, would get on, uh, uh, on a pilgrimage caravan, maybe in, in Samarkand, and there, wherever it stopped, because the trade routes and the, the pilgrimage routes coincided, he might hear of a famous scholar who was teaching in a madrasa in a particular city. He would stop off for a year, study under him, and then catch the, the, uh, the caravan again next year, eventually reaching Mecca. And when he reached Mecca, he would discuss these matters with, with, his, with his peers. So that the pilgrimage was the greatest uh, 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 means for the, uh, 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 the international understanding of, of mu Muslims from whatever corner of the Muslim world they came. Today, you're flown in and flown out. And whilst you are there, you are kept in a muskan, isolated from the, uh, the, Sau uh, 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 the, Sau uh, the population of Saudi Arabia. So they do not know from you what is going on outside Saudi Arabia, and you do not know from them what is going on. Now, this is breaking down. Today we live in the days of the inter internet. There are websites, there, there, there are net, networking sites that by which Muslims can communicate with each other across national front, uh, uh, front, uh, uh, frontiers. There are faxes, there are, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there, are, there, are there are videos, there are, deep, there are DV, DVDs. All of these modern methods can be used to bring down this criminal regime that is not only destroying our heritage, but is destroying Islam itself and has, through terrorism, brought Islam into universal discredit. Tamam. Today we've heard a great range from the physical to the spiritual. And uh, I want to focus, if we may, in our questions on the problems of planning and how it is being tackled. That is the subject of the day. And I think it's very easy to spread out into uh, religious philosophy. And it's a bit of a non-starter. They're a fact of our existence. Now, we have a question, and I would like people to think that they can ask a range of questions about the whole day. Gentlemen here. There's a microphone, sir, for you there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. We'll Hayder. have short questions, please, yeah, not the, too long. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Haider. Um, I have a bit of taste, you know, for, uh, you know, Muslim architect or arts. Um, I think, you know, if I look at this photograph, um, you know, image in general, even in art, it has its impression on the human being or your feeling. If you go, for example, to a site for sightseeing, if you don't like what you see, you will never come back to that site. And this is very important. And the planning permission is very important in taking role in keeping this uh, I mean, in mind, like in, in London, uh, there is no planning permission will be given to any building can restrict the view of St. Paul. Isn't right? Yes. And that's for because St. Paul, it has a meaning and it belongs to, I mean, some cultural or uh, values for the society. And I wonder, you know... Can I just <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the, the, the idea is, um, when I look at this site, I will never think again, this is Mecca. And this is very disturbing. The image here, it tells me that there are people who are importing new values, uh, and new issues to a society which has a different belief, you know. The, the existence of such a building does manifest, you know, a lack of planning or lack of intellectual 
uh, understanding of our society and raise the question is what are the role of the, the Muslim ulama scholars, the role of other Muslim countries in this matter and why they are keeping quiet about it. If I go to perform Hajj, for example, it is a traditional that when you enter the, the Holy Mosque and look at Mecca, uh, it gives you a feeling which really may be overwhelm, overwhelming for you. But if I sit down next to Mecca and I have this huge monster in front of me, that will disturb my uh, performance, you know. And this is, I think, you know, uh, it is a kind of a cultural dictatorship is implemented on people and all of us we have to question you know that and we'll be uh, we should answer that it's a good point yeah uh, thank you. madam thank you mr chairman i just wanted to make a very small correction Please. to the gentleman's perception of st paul's st yeah. paul's is is no longer i would suggest a celebration of being protected of uh, christian ethics it's actually there as the icon of World War II and protecting that fraud. And that is why we are all in the same state uh, of play as this lady said earlier. We cannot, due to the privileged veto, actually state the case against uh, what is uh, stopping us from uh, protecting our own cultures. We are actually simply celebrating New World Order imagery and Christianity most certainly is finished because Holocaustianity has taken over and World War II and that icon that you're speaking of is actually uh, what is really remaining in focus, not Christian ethic. Thank you. And another question? Yes. A uh, gentleman before mentioned about St. Paul's Cathedral. I just want to make it very clear. St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, and um, one or two other locations, specifically there's the Church of the Savoy, they are known <coughs> as, in law, um, Royal Peculiars, Royal Peculiars mm. and they come directly on, on the monarch as head of govern of the Church of England. And what's interesting, um, if I can, that's my point of information. Can I say any more? I'm not, not sure it's expressed quite correctly. I'm not convinced that St. Paul's is a royal peculiar, yes, but I it know is. that Westminster Abbey is. is. Yes, it is. Uh, as a matter of interest, I used to work for a member of the, uh, a late member of the Good. royal family. Okay. So I, I and what is your point? Knowledge. Uh, my, my point is this, um, that's my point of information. My a question I'd like to put to all the organisers, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, having the opportunity to come here because I learned a huge amount. The other yes. thing as well, I was just wondering, I would like to hear what the organisers would say about this. What I'd like to is to ask, um, because I think this is so very, very important from a cultural point of view, from a religious point of view, from a constitutional point of view, for so many different points of view, is it possible to organize an event like this every year as a way of just acting as a barometer? And not only that, allowing the opportunity for people like me or anybody else who is a little bit ignorant about so many issues that are going on because it gives us an opportunity to just compare and say, what's the situation? I had no idea anything like this was going on. And what's fascinating is just taking this, that photograph, that slide, and you see the sharp contrast between the moral, ethic, ethical, spiritual aspect, which runs through... Um, uh, the Judaism runs through Christianity, runs through the Muslim faith, and on the other hand, you've got what uh, Zaki identified, Dr. Zaki identified, putting his finger on it. There are these so-called, quote, forces linked to the occult world, and ironically linking to this very place, London, not very far from where we are at the moment, which have huge control to the very core, our capitalist society, or based on capital, linking to the central bank, which controls all the banks. But the reality is, we take it as something which is controlled by the government. The reality, that's not the case at all. It's actually these uh, very select 
a group of oligopolists and oligarchy that control the central banks, that control Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Bank of England of the 1694 Corporation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did you want to say something, please? Uh, be be assured, briefly as you can. This has nothing to do with theology. It has to do with your primary preoccupation very properly planning. Mm. The year I performed the pilgrimage, which was a long time ago, in 1975, and praise be to God, I saw those places before they achieved their present state of degradation. Uh, Two thirds of the pilgrims were Saudis out of one and a half million. Now these people, they perform the Hajj every year. If they could, like everybody else in the Muslim world, went once in a lifetime, or maybe twi uh, twice, the problem of overcrowding would be solved. Uh, perhaps this will be my last... Uh, <coughs> Don't believe uh, it. Uh, uh, Philip, uh, he saved me to go up upstairs. Uh, up, it's better that I say what I want to say than you, yes. and you uh, conclude everything uh, instead. Uh, uh, now, there is... Um, there will be uh, conferences hopefully very soon. We had hope that we, we have uh, many respond from, from, the, uh, uh, from the audience. But as I said in the, uh, earlier, that the cameras were more than the audience here. There, there, there's a three professors send, the, uh, actually two, two uh, friends of us, from, one from Italy, Attilio Porticelli, which is his expert on finance work in Mecca and Medina. Uh, he, was regret he regretted that he couldn't make it because he had a similar conference in France in the, uh, 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 the Institute Arab de Le Monde Arab. Uh, actually, today, probably he's still speaking. And the other one, Zainab Obenhebo from Turkey. She's expert on Sinan as well as Islamic site, and she's director of, uh, second director of uh, 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 Istanbul Museum. She wanted to come if... I told her two or three weeks ahead. And uh, hopefully the organizers here, uh, the, the people who pays the money sitting uh, around you uh, will hear or heard you. They will uh, give me more chance and, uh, and instead of four weeks or two weeks, they give me four months. I will certainly bring my friends if I am still alive. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and Lord Ahmed sent me a message about five minutes ago saying that he, uh, he is really sad he couldn't make it because he was uh, anxious to come here uh, to, uh, to speak for 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, and he, uh, he sort of uh, said his, uh, sent his apology. Um, uh, the last thing I want to say uh, to, my, uh, to my colleagues uh, I would leave the um, names away, but um, I apologize for any mistake in, done here today. And please put the blame on me, because I always had uh, uh, blamed all the time since uh, 1970s. Honey, you don't have to say that. <laughs> thank you've you. been an excellent and I, organizer, and thank you. Yes, I really thank you very much, and I leave the rest to Lord Hankey, which is my friend, my colleague, and uh, my, our chairman today. Thank you. Dr. Alain, we would like to say something. Uh, very quickly, if I may, so, so um, whilst our uh, 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 guest speakers were speaking, um, I, I, I realized there were three points which I needed to address to the public. One is the very famous hadith of the Prophet, which says that the Arab, naked Arab Bedouins, camel herders, would come and compete in building taller infrastructures or buildings, and which they are doing now in Mecca and, of course, in Dubai and across the Middle East. That's one hadith. And the other one is that um, some 50 years ago, uh, or 60 years ago, the maqam of Ibrahim, the footsteps of the Prophet Abraham, uh, was going to be demolished. And the, the Sheikh Sharif Niyas al-Tijani order, he wrote a book. He said uh, what uh, Brother Yaqub Zaki had said, Inna safa wal marwa min sha'ir Allah, these are the signs of Allah. Now, if you remove those signs, you can't do Umrah, you can't do your lesser pilgrimage or your Hajj. Because those are the sunnah of Hajra and Ismail, alayhi salam. But if you remove the maqam or the footprints of where the station of Ibrahim is, you have to do your rakatain there. And therefore, you can't. The excuse was, of course, when they're doing the tuaf, it comes in the way. 
So they stopped from there. The other one is, as one of the speak, uh, one of the audiences asked the question that that will distract these ugly towers are going to distract you when you are at the house of Allah, which is happening now. I have some friends who visited the holy sites, and they think that rather than looking at the beauty of the majestic house, you are looking at the clock tower, and people are looking opposite that way and doing the circulation, you know, and it's not on. So the spirituality has disappeared as well. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I think we're running out of time. But if one question, sir. Please, last one. We really should call things by themselves. This is nothing more, nothing less than the monstrosity of Disneyland being brought into the holy city of Mecca in the same way as Disneyland in America and Disneyland in Paris. And this is denigrating Islam. And I am absolutely saddened by it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, can I say that I find myself in the hot seat and I shall, if I can, say one or two concluding remarks. Islam is not alone in having divisions. I can only look at my Christian brothers. I went to Derry in Northern Ireland to sense the enormous difference between the Catholics in the bog side and the Protestants in the city of Derry. I didn't understand the difference, to be honest, apart from an ingrained enmity with each other that was born out of historical relationships. But we will all advance if we listen to each other. And I'm a Christian, but I work with Islam, I work with Confucianism, I work with Buddhism, and Hinduism, in Indonesia, in China. And I know that my message that I began today with, but I know that if we listen quietly to each other and find not the differences, but those factors which we think are those values that we hold in common, that's the only way of getting on in a globalizing world. It's very nice to foster our differences. It is harder and more challenging to listen to our similarities. And as I go around the world, as a planner, as an architect, and I deal with numerous different cultures in the Maghreb, South America, in the Caribbean, in China, Indonesia, in the United Kingdom, I recognize the enormous similarities that we have. And we can foster those similarities in a spirit of tolerance and understanding. And I know the Saudis may have taken some decisions which we don't understand. And I know that we don't understand them because they're not transparent about their decisions. So that, I think, is an important lesson. And they do perhaps make mistakes, but then Believe me, we all make mistakes. And in politics, much time is spent in correcting past mistakes. So with that planner's mind, I'd like us to thank uh, Dr. Hani al Seh and the organizers for what has been a very fruitful afternoon. And thank you all for the contributions which you've made. But now, I think we'll have a, an applause for the organizers and many thanks.